sometimes in the Christian life there comes that place where you have to make a decision. You have to decide whether you're going to walk with God or you're going to talk with God or you're going to ignore God and choose how, where, what, and why you do what you do. Because most people, when they come to Jesus, they want salvation. But they don't necessarily want everything that goes along with salvation. They want to have the wonderful life, the wonderful wife, two kids, a car, a house, a home, you know, jet skis, you know, all those things that most people want. At least they do in America. They want to have their cake and eat it too. After all, it's now how Christianity has been presented is that you can have and you should have a prosperous and abundant life. You know, abundance of possessions, abundance of things. You know, all those things that really God wants you to have. I mean, isn't that what God wants for you? To have all the toys for all the boys so that you could sit on the couch. You know, you could kick back and play the thumb games. You know, you're thumbing it through life. You're hitching a ride, only it's not with the thumb up, but the thumb on the game pad. The Game Boy. You know what I'm saying. The Xbox. Playing video games. Until the day one day in the certain near future that the video game comes home to life. And you discover that all those things that you thought were just goofy, like ghouls and goblins and you know evil looking things like zombies will come true in one way in the book of revelation we're told that once god opens up the abuso or the abyss the demonic beings come out and wreak havoc on the world you will see things that nobody ever dreamed or imagined were true that's scary so how and why people get saved really determines a lot of how they choose to live their life today. Jesus in his day challenged every single person that came to him. And he said, look, why are you coming to me? You come for the miracles. And I do. You come to see a prophet. And you've seen a prophet. You saw John the Baptist. Now he's had his head cut off. You come to hear the words, but why don't you do the things I said? Jesus will, in the future, ask every single Christian believer, have you done the things I said? And do you know what they are? Because there's a type of Christianity out nowadays that teaches you to pick and choose what you want to gain for yourself by the promises of God. All you need to do is sign your name to it and it's yours. And people have abused that teaching that Spurgeon once said was just a matter of faith of accepting. Well, nowadays they think that it's claiming instead of professing the faith that God wants for you to have in accepting what he's doing in your life and participating with him. So if you see there's been a distortion and a contortion of what Spurgeon meant. So no, you don't sign your name to it and get it. It's not an unconditional promise that no matter what, you get it. That's it. Oh boy. Be careful. You may get it for all the wrong reasons because God will not be a debtor to any man. And when you get it, it may be your condemnation that you're getting it from. Tozer tells us to examine ourselves. Tozer requires that we look at and to seek out, really, what's going on inside of our heart. Where the issues of why we do things, the way we do things, comes from. And if we don't examine those things, if we don't sit down and really ask God, why? Why do I do these things? 
why am I the way I am? Then we never get to the heart of the matter and we never grow as a Christian. We only develop in the way that we want to be, but not the way that God designed us to be. We don't go forward and we don't grow up because we choose to stop living the way God wanted us to live. Whenever I read Tozer, whenever I look at what he has to say, I'm always challenged by his words. Because Jesus in my early life, when I first became a Christian, challenged me directly to my core. He said, do you love me? And you know the way the rest goes, well, feed my sheep. No, he asked me, do you love me? And he asked me to give up something that I was unwilling to do. He required of me some obedience that I would not do. And I'm sure you wouldn't either. You see, I was sitting in the middle of the you know, USMC, United States Marine Corps. And I sat there while a drill instructor who had been replaced, who had replaced the previous drill instructor, had just got back from Nam. And he was a gung-ho killer machine. He wanted to make his corps and his crew one badass killing machine, each and every one of us. He wanted us to love killing the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong. And so he was good at the viciousness and the evil with which you could see in his soulless eyes and inspired those who wanted, out of pride of country, integrity of service, you know, wanting to be just like him, and deify killing as a killing machine would. And so as I sat there, and I was in the evening listening to the drill instructor have his, they have these times where they kind of try to be a little nicer. They kind of have the whole platoon together. And we all listen while he talks. But it's a downtime, and it's an easier time. So when he was talking, God compelled me. There was this great impetus for me to turn my head, to get up and to walk out. And I said, no, Lord, because I felt that before. God had inspired me and made me feel that. It's almost like gravity pulling your head and twisting your head around. And I just felt my head twisting, and I just, not like a demon. <laughs> twisting and I felt that desire to get up and I could visualize almost myself turning, getting up and walking out the door. Well, of course, if I had done that, I'd be thrown in the brig. But I refused. I would not get up to obedience of Jesus compelling me to go. So instead, the next day, they stripped us down and in the morning we got into showers, you know, with the drill instructor standing there. And he made us swear that we would become killing machines in his core. Stark naked standing there that we were just swearing up and down that we would die for and kill for country. It wasn't God, country, and, you know, the American way, the American dream. No, it was to kill for killing sake. And you could tell that about the drill instructor. Well, it wasn't long after that that suddenly my innards started vomiting, so to speak, of all this evil that had come upon me. And as a born-again Christian, this obviously was not the place for me to be. God eventually took me to sick bay, and I wound up being trans-shipped over to Balboa Naval Hospital, and wound up being medi honorably medically discharged from the Marine Corps, and nearly died afterwards, quite frankly. And it took about 10 years of nearly dying finally started living again. But what God wanted at that moment, I knew beyond any shadow of a doubt. He didn't want me there. And it was something I had made a commitment to before I got saved. I had signed up for the Marine Corps in the delay program and went in. And obviously as a Jesus freak, that wasn't probably the best thing to do. Though Campus Crusade for Christ was on base. But when that new drill instructor took over, it was obvious that there was a spiritual battle there. And I lost. So God will at times challenge you in ways that you don't know and can't imagine that God himself would do something like that. You see, 
had I probably gotten up and maybe lost my pride by obeying Jesus, because I was so proud to be a Marine, then, yeah, I might have wound up with a dishonorable discharge, maybe gone about, you know, the world with this cursed opinion of it, being that they would think that I was some kind of failure, which later on in life I had to work on because of my disability. God may have done something different with my life sooner than what he's done now. But God used that time of knowing that I had disobeyed to teach me what obedience was. Because in other times of my life when I did obey, it was obvious the blessings that came my way. And believe me, the long 10 year journey that that started from that night on, whew, that was rough. And I know that it was all connected from that day that I decided to disobey rather than obey what God was telling me to do. True believers do not shy away from obedience. But now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit unto holiness and the end everlasting life. Romans 6.22 It has been quite overlooked in recent times that the faith of Jesus is an absolute arbiter. It preempts the whole redeemed personality and seizes upon the individual to the exclusion of all other claims. Or more accurately, it makes every legitimate claim on the Christian's life conditional and without hesitation decides the place each claim shall have in the total scheme. The act of committal to Jesus in salvation releases the believing man from the penalty of sin, but it does not release him from the obligation to obey the words of Jesus. Rather, it brings him under the joyous necessity to obey. Tozer nails it right where the rubber meets the road. It's one thing to say that you're saved by grace and that not of yourself, lest any man should boast, and that you don't have works of righteousness which you have done, but according to his mercy saved you, or that you could add anything to what Jesus has done. But you can't add this one thing to what Jesus said. Are you obeying him? Because if you're not, Jesus put on the Sermon on the Mount at the very end of his discourse about the kingdom of heaven, if you're not doing the things I said, then... I will say to you, depart from me, I never knew you. That's a scary thought. Many that were called, not being chosen, determined for themselves to do those things anyways in the name of Jesus, and in the name of Christ, in the name of religion, in the name of Christianity. And Jesus says, I depart from me, I never knew you. You know, what, what are you telling me? Yeah, you did miracles, so what? Yeah, you healed people, so what? Yeah, you did all this junk. So what? Did you know me? And that's what Jesus asked. Did you know me? You know, did you visit the sick, the healed, the poor, the destitute, the homeless? Did you help them? Did you care about them? Nope. If you didn't, you don't know Jesus. Because, see, that's where he's at now. He's not busy with the church. The church is pretty much going its own way, and it's pretty independent and self-willed and self-governing. Although God tries to walk in the midst of him and says, look, you know, you've kicked me out so far that I'm even standing on the outside of the church knocking to get in. But you do find him on the highways and byways, and you find him in other countries, usually poor and needy. Because that's what God is at, poor and needy. But he's also with those who choose to obey rather than sacrifice. You see, to obey is better than sacrifice. So in obeying, Jesus, you have to have a conversation with him and to know him. You have to be able to talk to him and to understand what he's saying to you. Because if you don't, you won't enter into the kingdom of heaven. Look at the epistle of the New Testament and notice how largely they are given over to what is erroneously called hortatory matter. By dividing the epistles into doctrinal and hortatory passages, we have relieved ourselves of any necessity to obey. The doctrinal passages require from us nothing except that we believe them, and the so-called hortatory passages are harmless enough for the very word by which they are described declares them to be words of advice and encouragement rather than commandments to be obeyed. 
this is a palpable error. The exhortations in the epistles are to be understood as apostolic injunctions carrying the weight of mandatory charges from the head of the church. They are intended to be obeyed, not accepted or rejected as we will. If we would have God's blessing upon us, we must begin to obey. Tozer doesn't mess around. When you read him, when you understand the reality that God said, that means it's a commandment. And Jesus said, this is my commandment. A, that you love one another, that your joy may be full, and B, that you do the things I said. And the Sermon on the Mount isn't like some idea of some philosophical point of view where you can just say, well, you know, yeah, be a peacemaker, but you know, we're, we're not meek and you know, we're, we're violent. We take the kingdom of heaven by force. No, that was meant to be against those that were taking it by force. It's a condemnation. Jesus was teaching the Sermon on the Mount and telling people what to be like. And yet, we say we don't have to love our enemies. We can kill them instead. We say we don't have to turn the other cheek. We can act in self-defense. We say lots of Christian ethical moral ideas, but we don't do the things that Jesus said. The question will be in heaven rather than on earth. Because on earth, man will argue about it and debate. But the only thing I have to ask you, are you going to do the things that Jesus said? Will you obey?